Thank you everybody for joining this evening and I'd very much like to welcome Rory tonight who's kindly given up his evening to talk to us about technology um, and I think Rory to get us started would you, could you tell us a little bit about yourself just to let us know what you do. Well hi everybody uh, good good to be talking to you live from my kitchen I should warn you I've got my dinner in the oven and I may leap up at some stage just turn the oven off um, uh, yeah uh, I'm Rory Catherine Jones I was for 40 years uh, uh, a staff member at the BBC uh, covering first business and then technology. I spent uh, 15 years as technology correspondent in my final job, a great job, covering uh, all sorts of developments, starting with uh, the first big story I did was the the being there when the iPhone was launched, which was the sort of beginning of the smartphone era. Um, I retired, well, I would say moved on, almost exactly a year ago. It's about it's about a year since my leaving party. Um, and since then, I have had a, uh, what you might call a portfolio career. I do a bit of this and a bit of that. One of the things I do is write what's called a Substack newsletter about health and technology, health tech. Uh, and, you, you know, obviously, the technology has been a long term interest, but so has health, because I've got two long term conditions. Um, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the beginning of 2019. Um, I'd, about um, six months earlier, I'd been on holiday with my wife and she kept criticising me for dragging my feet. Pick your feet up, she said. Uh, and that turned out to be uh, a key symptom. Uh, but uh, longer ago, back in 2005, I was diagnosed with a malignant melanoma behind my left eye, which is quite a sort of scary thing for which I've had repeated surgery including proton beam surgery and in fact I'm having more treatment for that this week um so two two conditions both of which have focused my mind on a how the health service works and uh how we you how we share our data how we're informed uh about uh our condition and how that's shared with uh not very efficiently around the health service but also very interested in technological developments uh, and I'm a newcomer, really, to health journalism, so I'm learning a lot as I go, but uh, particularly interested in wearable technology and how that applies to people with Parkinson's. Well, thank you, Rory. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about wearable technology in a moment, if that's all right. But uh, just before we start going to what this health technology side, how did you, everyone has a difficult time when they're diagnosed, and, and probably for several months after that. Um, did you feel you had any extra challenges being in the public eye? Well... I'm not entirely sure that I did. Um, I think uh, I, I lots of lots of people when they're diagnosed want to keep it secret for quite good reasons. Of, of, honestly, not every employer is sympathetic. Not every person is is sympathetic. There's still, in, for some people, feel a stigma around the condition. But I didn't feel that. I told my bosses quite soon, and they were reasonably sympathetic. Um, and uh, I actually made the decision. I'd been thinking about coming out about it, as it were. Um, and then a day in May of that year, May 2019, I did a live broadcast from uh, Covent Garden about the launch of 5G in, in, in Britain. Um, and we, it was quite an exciting live broadcast because we were using a 5G network to do the broadcast into breakfast television. And I was holding a phone. And afterwards, I went to do some more filming and my producer said to me, have you thought about going public about it? And I said, yeah, I have thought about it. But why? Why do you say that? And she said, well, it was very obvious on the television that you had this quite severe tremor. And my, my tremor comes and goes. It's particularly pronounced at moments of stress. Obviously, being live on television is stressful. Not quite as stressful as watching Brentford Football Club from the terrace, which I do. <laughs> where I'm all over the place. Um, so I I did come out. I I did it in a tweet. I'm a uh, obsessive user of Twitter, uh, and it was a good thing. I mean, I got great reaction. Uh, mostly incredibly sympathetic. One person said, "You've been standing too near too many 5G phone masts." But apart from that, a, a, a really nice reaction. So I didn't find that um, stressful. In fact, I found. I mean, everyone who is a TV reporter is a big show off anyway. So um, 
I didn't find it that stressful. I found it useful. And I, I found I really enjoyed actually being part of this Parkinson's community. I've met all sorts of really interesting people. Um, and it's given, given me a, a new sort of lease of life for my journalism because it's it's something to to focus on. That's good. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, if we can start now, perhaps talking a bit more about what you actually talk about in your newsletter and things. Um, Perhaps we could talk about the state of health services technology first of all. And um, many of us find the new patient portal systems that are being introduced into the health services are a bit confusing. Um, it seems that there are different systems in place in different places, and that some of the areas the services aren't totally signed up, and you only get part of it and everything else. Is this your experience around the country? Have you seen the same thing? Well, I've experienced it personally. Um, I mean. As I said, I've had this eye condition, which has mean I, I've had a, a relationship with Moorfields Hospital for 17 years and uh, have had a regular experience there. Of I used to go there for a regular clinic every four months in, a, in the basement. Uh, and it, it was weird because it, it was always packed. It was hot. It was unpleasant. And they used to have on a whiteboard 47 patients today. You can expect to wait about four hours. And you used to wait four hours, but you used to go through this complete rigmarole, touring the hospital, having different things done to you. And then, at, But then at the end of it, you got to see literally the world's leading expert in your condition. So you had the good and bad of the health service. Vast amounts of paper, you know, being shuffled around very inefficiently. And I, it, it really struck me how badly behind the curve the NHS was. Now, I think there's been a big acceleration in the last three or four years, uh, particularly in terms of patient communication. Um, I think the, in some ways the best of it is uh, the use of text messages. I mean, I, I really value, as somebody who's quite forgetful, getting constant reminders. I've had a couple today about an appointment I've got tomorrow. And I think that that really works. But you're right, these new patient portals they are very clunky um, and they're not, well, it's not clear how much data they really give you. Um, I use mine to order my Parkinson's medication every every month um, uh, and, and it kind of works for that. But in terms of getting the, the, uh, the, the information you need, for instance, that they're not very good. And, and part of the problem is there's this paranoia, which you can understand in the health service, about the sharing of data. Everybody is terrified of running foul of data protection laws. And, and you can understand that, but I, I, I think there's almost too much emphasis on privacy and not enough on the utility of sharing data. So I've got these two conditions. Uh, and uh, I've got a GP, I've got a consultant at Moorfields and a consultant for Parkinson's at the Charing Cross Hospital. And they're all on different islands and they find it very difficult to share. So, you know, I had to tell the, the Parkinson's and, uh, and the, the eye doctors uh, that I'd found that there was potentially a link between the two conditions. And... If I hadn't told them, they wouldn't have known about my other condition, uh, which is not very good. And one other example, uh, my eye condition was first spotted by a high street optometrist, a really good one with very advanced machines. And they, they sent me off to Moorfields originally. Uh, and some years later, they spotted something new, which wasn't that serious. It was a, a membrane growing across the eye, which is that's quite a common thing. Uh, and the optometrist said to me, I can't actually send these images because I'm not allowed to. Uh, the, the regulations don't allow. So why don't you film it on your iPhone and then take it to the doctor, which is what I had to do, which struck me as balmy. So they are making progress, but there is still far too much fear of sharing data um, and a culture where each organisation keeps it rigidly to itself for fear of it escaping. I also feel sometimes that they don't they don't all use the same systems, do they? Because I, for example, have to order my prescriptions on one system. But if I get an appointment at the hospital locally, I get, it's on another system. Oh, yeah. But my, but my GP is linked into the same system. So why isn't it all joined up? I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. 
seems very odd. But do you think, do you, do you hear anything that makes you feel that uh, things are going to change in the future? Or is it well, it is changing. I mean, the, the, the digitization of health records has proceeded a, a, a pace, but there are two different suppliers to GPs. I forget their names. Um, uh, so you've already got, you know, at uh, least two different systems. Um, and there is a big, one of the big problems is sharing of he GP health records. I've written, I've written today about another story around this. Um, uh, GPs, for understandable reasons, are very protective of their records of, and are very concerned about letting them out there even with patient permission. So there is a, there is a, a database that was built in the 2000s called UK Biobank, which got half a million people signed up to be monitored uh, constantly uh, as part of a health research program. And they all of them have signed up to allow their GP records to be shared with the system. But the, only, one, only one in five GPs actually pressed the button to allow that data to be shared because they were so paranoid, because they, they are the data controller, they were so paranoid about data protection. So there are lots of issues there. It is, it is getting better. I mean, today, uh, there's an update on, on that kind of thing. There's a big new program being launched called Our Future Health, which is trying to recruit 5 million people to have their health monitored over a long period. Uh, with the bonus that not only will they contribute to research, but they will be contacted if they uh, it appears they're at higher risk from things like heart disease and diabetes, and who knows, possibly Parkinson's. So there, there are all sorts of initiatives happening, but they happen quite slowly. Okay. Right, perhaps we could change the topic slightly, go over to wearable technology, and uh, quite a few services are now introducing wearable technologies. Mainly I've heard of the PKG watch, and some people hate it, some people love it. I know why do people hate it? I've never quite understood why people would hate well, it. Well, because it's very clunky. It was very clunky initially. I suspect you've only seen the latest version. The first version was, it was really, really big, and you had to wear it all the time when you were asleep and everything else, and it wasn't great for that. Um, well, as far as I understand it, I mean, I think the thing to think about all of these uh products is that they're at a very early stage mm. um they're experimental and, and what people didn't seem to realize about the pkg was it, it as far as i understand it it's not given to you you you're given it for 10 days and then oh, it goes back, back to the doctor to download the data from it so it's only uh, at the moment it feels very you know experimental uh and yes it has it's got sort of uh, partial uh, approval by NICE, but it's not very far along the track. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of interesting work going on with wearables. It's mostly about measurement, which, as we know, is a huge problem. I always say, you know, you see a consultant once every nine months or whatever, if you're lucky, and they say to you, well, how's it going? And you go, mm, I don't know, really. Um, and it depends whether it's been a good day or a bad day. And it's very difficult to quantify. And every time I see mine, you know, my my medication is is altered and then don't see them for months again and it's altered again. Um, and being able to measure Parkinson's better is vital, not just for uh, knowing how you're progressing, but also if we're going to get uh, useful drugs, because you can't get a drug through a drug trial unless you can quantify its effect. Uh, and that is, you know, the, the scale, the UPDRS scale, which was invented a long time ago, it seems to me pretty crude, basically one to four on various things. And a lot of these wearables uh, are about getting a finer grain quantification of your symptoms. So I, I went and saw one fascinating experiment in Bristol, uh, and it was run by the, the consultant, Dr. Alan Wone, who ran the, the famous GDNF, yeah. GDNF 
drug trial, which created a lot of hope and then sort of faded because uh, it wasn't seen as quite good enough, the drug. And his belief was that that was a measurement problem. They, they, they were unable to show that it was that much better than a placebo. So he is using this house, which has been set up by Bristol University for some years, which I dubbed the sort of Parkinson's big brother house. And it's full of sensors and people go and stay there for, uh, uh, people with Parkinson's go and stay there for a week. Uh, uh, and they're measured as it were, uh, their symptoms are measured. And the idea is that eventually technology could be developed that could be installed in the homes of drug trialists to see how they responded to, to drugs. Um, so, so that's one development, but, and I've been involved in a couple of other trials of trying to develop uh, a, a wearable that, that would do something similar, but they're all, there's a lot of these different trials and um, I don't think there's, there's, there seem to be two paths. There's one that goes down the Apple watch route uh, which, I mean, obviously it has the benefit of quite a lot of people have an Apple Watch. Um, and there's a, another route where it's a dedicated de device just for this, where the advantage is, is it will have a much better battery life. The trouble with the Apple Watch is it needs charging every day, which is not great. Um, and it's doing tons of other things, obviously, besides measuring Parkinson's. So... Those are the two routes that people are going down. Which do you think is likely to come out on top? Do you think it's going to be a mixture of the two? I think that, you know, there will, there will be both. And, you know, um, uh, there'll be sort of dedicated but kind of ugly clinical devices. And then there will be sort of flashier apps on Apple Watch, which... Um, I kind of think will be less, will be more accessible uh, and intuitive, but possibly less yes. well regarded by clinicians. I don't know. I think it's just been approved in the States, hasn't it? Some of the, some of the applications on the Apple Watch. I think, yeah, I, I, I think so. But One I, of the things on the Apple Watch is good is the fall, there's a fall monitor on it. So if you fall over it, it knows you've fallen over. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, that's... Um, Which is quite helpful when you, <laughs> you start falling with Parkinson's. Although the, the, I've seen a report that people on roller coasters have ended up calling <laughs> 999. Uh, yeah, you have to be a bit careful. It's, if it yeah. goes off, you have the option to turn it off, so you can yeah. stop it happening. But it, yeah. yes, you do have to be a bit careful. But I was actually banging my, my walking boots out outside yesterday and thought I'd had a fall, so that was interesting as well. Yeah. <laughs> but this gives you the option anyway. And, and you're, you're trying out something called a Q1 as well, aren't you? Is that, that's something different. Yes. That's now, this is a really interesting device. I'd heard about this for a while. Uh, and then the team behind it, who really nice, four young people who'd all studied at Imperial College on this innovation design course, came and fitted me with it. And I'm wearing it right now. It's, it's, it's a company called Charco. It's a little round device, kind of like a yo-yo. Um, and I don't know if, yeah, there it, there it goes. I, I've, I've set it off uh, and it kind of vibrates with a sort of rhythm. Um, and it lasts, its battery life is reasonably good. You, you do charge it every night, but, um, and in fact, I'm supposed to keep, keep it going all the time. And it's using some technique called queuing, which I've kind of, I Googled and they told me it, 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 is, it is an accepted, technique um to help people with um their gait by kind of giving them a, a rhythmic sort of pulse and a, i don't really understand how it works but in theory it does and when they came to fit me with it they there were four of them uh there was the, the young woman who'd founded the company and and uh, three assistants and one of the assistants was an ex had been trained in UPDRS the, uh, the the measurement system for Parkinson's uh, and he got me to do those very familiar exercises uh, doing that and walking up and down uh, getting up from the chair and so on went, went right through the whole 20 exercises 
and marked me. Uh, and then they put this thing on me and made me wear it for an hour. And then they did the same exercises again. And they told me that I'd improved by nine points, whatever nine points is, which he said was, you know, uh, a clinically significant amount. Um, uh, now, I've been wearing it ever since. I find it uh, slightly difficult to work out whether it is having an impact, but that's partly because I feel my, my symptoms are quite mild. They're mainly about when I'm walking, kind of dragging my, my right side so much that it becomes very tiring. Um, and I find it quite difficult to work out whether that is improved or not. But um, it's check very... Check the wear on your shoes. Check, check the wear on your heels of your shoes. Oh, no, my wear on my <laughs> shoes is, is terrible. I go through right shoes like nobody. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a classic. That's the best measurement tool on that one, I think. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, m my wife sitting at the breakfast table sometimes says, "I can hear you humming." <laughs> the thing does. You get used to it after a while, but it's a, a gentle hum all the time. I had the chance to try out some um, virtual reality glasses from Stroll, the company called Stroll, oh, yeah. the other day. I just tried them on for a few minutes. And they're quite clever because they put things, if you have trouble moving, if you're starting to hesitate slightly, they have, um, the option, you can put things in front of yourself in virtual and, and, and walk over them or step on them. Or in my case, I find trouble sometimes going through doorways. So they put a balloon up ahead of me beyond the doorway and you actually have to move and put your hand to pop the balloon. So they're really augmented well. reality glasses. They're, they're yeah. putting yeah. virtual objects in a real world. Yes, that's it, yeah. Yeah, and apparently they're still under trial at the moment, but it's quite interesting to try it out because yeah. it's funny how some things sometimes do help. You never know if they'd help long term. That's the trouble with all these things. No, um, yeah, I mean, I used to do lots of stories about virtual reality and augmented reality, which which was a huge thing. Lots of money poured into it and didn't really pay off in terms because it's mainly at first, obviously aimed at the games world and people were. <laughs> It didn't really take off quite as expected. So they then started saying it has got all sorts of other applications. And I remember once interviewing a psychiatrist who used it to treat people with phobias. So uh, there were people with a phobia of getting into a lift and they put on a headset and be taken into a sort of virtual lift. Uh, and he claimed it worked. So, yeah, it's yeah, so still kind of, I don't know, uh, I don't know what people think. A lot of these things feel a bit kind of marginal. Might be interesting, but, you know, I think we're all impatient for some great leap forward. Yes, and that's we right. seem to be a, a bit at the edge sometimes. And also the other problem they've all got is the devices are too big. So you actually put on a pair of goggles, which you wouldn't exactly walk down the road in at the moment. So right. they're trying to get them. But they were trying with Google, was it Google Glasses as well. They were trying to do. Well, I well. wore Google Glass, but Google Glass was a great experiment i was very excited about i got one for quite a large amount of money to try out i wore it for three months uh when i was a bbc technology correspondent and i thought it was great and then eventually i realized that what everybody said was right my friends my family my colleagues i looked like an idiot so i stopped <laughs> and that was the problem yes yeah, so it's going to be a problem with all of these things i suspect yeah yeah so in a more general point, I mean, what's the most effective technical aid that you've ever seen for people with Parkinson's? What do you reckon is the best one you've seen? I haven't. I, I've i got to be honest. I, 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 I There's nothing that I've seen that is really groundbreaking. I've seen various sort of devices that claim to um, help people with a tremor, sort of writing devices. Um, I'm having what uh, I got an email today from the American Parkinson's Association talking about something called mild cognitive impairment, um, an early stage cognitive difficulty that does not interfere with the person's ability to perform activities independently, but can nevertheless affect a person's performance of more complex cognitive tasks. And I think I'm having an episode of that now because I'm trying to remember that. The, the product I'm talking about. Um, yeah, uh, but in general, I've seen, you know, 
a number of these wearables. Um, I've seen, I mean, th this frankly is the most interesting thing I've seen. Um, the, the thing that, the, the only thing I've seen which really claims, because as I said, most of the stuff is about measuring your symptoms. Yeah. The only, the only device that I've seen which at least claims, and some people have validated this, to um, Im Im improve your symptoms in some way. Um, so I think there's a lot of activity around, but I can't say that there's any great leaps forward that I, I've seen yet. Okay, I mean, there's obviously the measurement thing, which is really important, as you say, for research. They need that um, ability yeah. to measure before and after. Yeah. But the other thing I, I find is I would love to know, I mean, I have my uh, knowledge about diabetes and obviously people there can measure their blood sugar level. And that's mm. actually really helpful to them because they know whether it's going up or going down. And wouldn't it be just lovely to be able to do the same for your dopamine level? Perhaps when you've been diagnosed a bit longer, it becomes more important. And oh, I would love to know. Yeah. Well, I'd love to know when it, my dopamine levels starting to drop, and it would help oh, well, me that enormously. That would be fascinating, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I mean that that involves a whole other great leap forward, which, uh, as far as I know, is 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 nowhere in sight. No, I mean that what's fascinating about I, I I've written something about the the whole community around diabetes, uh, where parents of kids with diabetes, and I've got a cousin who's got a daughter with diabetes. And, uh, they're, very, they're very active, but the, the parents have got together and basically hacked a fantastic system, which allows the, the monitoring and delivery of insulin um, to the young person without them having to actively you know, inject themselves. Um, so that, that's exactly the sort of clever idea that, that we need, I suppose. Mm. But it's a it, it's a much more sort of obvious uh, treatment path for diabetes, obviously, than, than there is for Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a much more unknowable condition. It strikes me. Yes, that's for, that's for, yeah, I suppose that's true. Um, Martha, I wonder if there's any um, questions you'd like to put up on the screen. I, I can see there's some some questions in the Q and A box. Let's have a quick look. There are some. Yeah, I'll pop them up now. Oh, okay, Sharon was asking about the Q1, which we've talked about as well. well I, I, I can talk about how I'm getting on with it, um, okay. what she asked, which is that um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it. I, I'm trying to remember to put it on every morning. Um, and I'm particularly using it when I'm out walking. And I'm wondering whether I should use it more but I am still asking myself whether it um whether it will have an impact but what I'm impressed by is the team behind it and how good they are about interacting with their users there's a whole Facebook group set up of of people who are using it where which is another great sort of community where people answer questions so that that is useful um yeah Martha, which one are you going to put up now? I'm just coming up with the next question, which is about people being diagnosed with two conditions. Um, right, let me just move that box. Uh, it's interesting when you were diagnosed with two conditions, one being I was diagnosed with cancer at the same time as Parkinson's and it almost put Parkinson's on the back burner. As it, this is so, Sharon, this is so like my experience. Um, so uh, mine weren't at the same time. It was many years afterwards. Actually, uh, I can fully appreciate, you know, that for many people, it's a terrible thing to get a Parkinson's diagnosis. For me, just like you say, um, it was oh, it's just another damn thing. Uh, when I was diagnosed with a malignant melanoma behind the eye, and which was potentially life-threatening, um, I was very shocked, very frightened. Uh, and then over the years, you get used to, you know, it, it's a tumour that's constantly there, but very dormant now. Um, so Parkinson's didn't seem to be anything like as scary. Um, 
and my, my, my father had it, but he had it quite late in life. Um, he'd been ill with other things. So I kind of knew about it and it was, oh God, not another thing, but it wasn't anything like as scary as, as the cancer diagnosis. Now, Richard Archer, you had a question in the Q&A as well as uh, your hand up. So I'm going to just ask Richard, are you there? If you are, would you like to unmute? Perhaps you'd like to ask your question. OK, well, the question I would like to ask is what experience have you had with the Symbix Biomi laser gun treatment, which apparently stimulates the gut to produce the dopamine that it doesn't normally provide and apparently has startling results for all the Parkinson's sufferers I've heard who've used it. Uh, I've got to confess I've never heard of it so uh, the, the answer is zero experience but I'm now going to google it it's it's the Symbix. It's yes it, I did put the question up. So I've, I've just seen it in, in, in the uh, in the chat yeah. It's S-Y-M-B-Y-X Biomi. It's an Australian company, and it is new, and it's just been developed for Parkinson's. Right. Um, Stimbix Biome Therapies. Let's see if there's any news about it. A light at the end of the tunnel for Parkinson's sufferers, it says, uh, but, but one very obscure uh, Australian outfit. Uh, 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 yeah. I've got to pay a dollar a week to get um, access to that story. So I won't right now. Um, fine. I mean, that that's fascinating. Um, I don't know if it uh, is actually uh, available in the UK. Is it available in the UK, Richard? Yes, it is. The gun costs £1,145 to purchase. Right. And it is self-applied. Right. Well, one would want to know quite a lot more about it and about what regulators said about it is it mhra approved that kind of thing um and what nicer said hey google stop sorry that's another that's telling me <laughs> just i'm just going to turn the oven off <laughs> sorry it's my dinner that looks great sausage casserole <laughs> going to be ready in 20 minutes <laughs> Excellent. Very right. Nice. So that's something that might be something for your newsletter one day. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's a great tip. Thank you very much. Well, I've been exploring the potential for it. And I'm, every time I find somebody who's used it, I hear very glowing reports. I thought um, you might have heard about it. I tell you what, I will. I will. Um, I'm putting my this, this is slightly mad, uh, but I'm putting my email address in in the chat to you um and feel free to send me stuff about it um and i will try to investigate i i'm i start from a position of always being i'm a, a cynical old hack um uh slightly skeptical about things that sound like miracle cures but um i'm always interested to know more about them what I liked about it was it made logical sense. Right. What it does makes sense. Because yeah. it's reversing the negative impact for Parkinson's sufferers, i.e. the dopamine production. Apparently, the gut is the crucial source of dopamine. Right. Right. Um, you would think that some of our extremely clever Neurology, neurologists at you know Queen Square or whatever would know about this. Um, anyway, I, uh, I feel a project coming on for you. <laughs> yes, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Okay, uh, right. Moving on. Thank you, Richard. Um, another question in the Q and A box is: Could you say a bit more about the Apple Watch? I don't know what else you could say. Well, what I can say about the Apple Watch is that I've dealt with Apple for a long time, and Apple is the most secretive and difficult company on earth. They're a very clever company, but they guard their information carefully. Uh, and there is what is called a, um, uh, a movement disorder uh, sort of software package, API, uh, uh, around 
the Apple Watch, which they they supply, and various companies have tried to work with it, and and I hear some good and some bad things about it. Um, and there, there, there are questions whether a, a watch is the best way to to, to measure, um, you know, one's symptoms. There, there are other other things that you know strap to your leg or, or so on. So, I, I think it's exciting. Um, I think I'd be slightly cautious about, you know, how accurate it would be as a. Uh, as a device for, for for measuring your symptoms, uh, and what what and the, the the other slight issue with all of this is that all of these things throw off a lot of data, um, and there, there's there's two forms in which they can go. They can uh, the most useful in theory is is data that uh, can be accessed by clinicians, but there's a rather the I mean, the other use, which is obviously of interest to me, and I'm sure lots of you, is an app that you and I could use on our smartphone to give us an update on how we were doing. But in terms of the clinician side, um, you know, I suppose the question is, how eager would they be to deal with this flood of data from all their patients? You can quite see them going to hide under a desk presented with them, um, you know, I've got this new gadget doctor and it's going to tell you all about me every day. Can you can you monitor me, please? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. That's one of the big problems. They haven't got the capability of translating it back into their own systems as well. So yeah. it doesn't interface directly yeah. into the data systems they're using. There's an enormous administration task. Mm. Um, Martha, do you have Peter's question on the slide? Because it's quite a long question. Yes, uh, I do. Would you put that one up, please? I'm making sure I've got the right one. Is that Peter Hillman, that one? Yes, yes, it is, yes. I can so see everybody can see it. Yeah, so that everybody can see it. No, that's fine. Right. I had a cancer diagnosis after I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. The treatment for the cancer included chemotherapy. There's little proactive information of how they interact. For example, the impact of chemo on my general health included tiredness that made it more difficult to maintain the levels of exercise, which in turn had an impact on the Parkinson's. This is absolutely you know, right and interesting that it's just another example of how unintegrated um, the health service is. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same everywhere. I mean, you know, pe neurologists and cancer doctors and eye doctors, they are all, you know, slightly in a silo. They know an awful lot about their particular area and possibly not so much about other areas um I, I can completely see that uh you know undergoing chemotherapy would not have a great effect on one's ability to um exercise uh which i too find very valuable what i found uh valuable is having a dog which our dog sadly died earlier this year i'm hoping we'll get another one quite soon because that was a uh, that was my uh, uh, an essential part of my treatment was walking the dog every morning before often before seven yeah there's a very good thing about having dogs we've just got our third one so we have a puppy in the house and that certainly makes you uh, oh can you lend active. me the puppy <laughs> <laughs> You might not say yes to that if you saw she goes hurtling around the house like a maniac. <laughs> anyway, so, no, she's good for my Parkinson's. <laughs> um, there's another question on the screen. Would you like to put across the top question from Sharon, please, Martha? Coming up. Thank you. She's real good at this, isn't she? <laughs> this is very good, very efficient. Right, let me read it out. Do you think we're in danger of being hijacked by technology as an easy target? I think it's all very well measuring symptoms, etc. But if you follow the ethos, if you've met one person with Parkinson's and you've met one person with Parkinson's, then where does that leave us? Uh, yes, that, that, that is a good point. I, I think the other thing is that um, technology goes through these fashions. Um, uh, Jane and I were talking about virtual reality earlier. Um, virtual reality was a huge fashion about five, six years ago. It was going to be the answer to everything. 
and I think people are more skeptical now. Similarly, you know, wearable technology now is is the answer to everything, and there's something called the I think it's the Gartner hype cycle where uh, it goes up and up and up and then down and down and down into the slough of despond, and then finally the plateau of fulfillment at the end. So what what happens is that people get overexcited by things like AI, by things like virtual reality, by things like wearables, then they dismiss them completely. And then finally, there's a sort of proper level of realism and real generally generally valuable products come through. But we shouldn't, uh, you know, invest all of our hopes in, in any, any of this technology before it's been validated. Um, and you also make the very good point of how various a condition Parkinson's is. Uh, and it's quite difficult to think of any device that would, would have uh, uh, an effect on, you know, 90% of the Parkinson's population. Because no, no. no, everybody's at different stages as well. Not only is everybody's symptom pattern different, it's also at different stages by the time of, length of time they've had the diagnosis. But I think what is true is that we all, or lots of us these days, have a thirst, a thirst for knowledge, as they say. Yes. Um, and so if, if there can be some way of quantifying what's happening to us, um, just as my, my watch, uh, I mean, I, one of the things I like about it is the, these targets it sets me for movement each day. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to close all these rings today. Um, if, if, we, if we could get a device which at least gave us some sort of uh, readout of how... how uh what our UPDRS score was and and how it responded to exercise for example I think you know a lot of people would find that useful um but we shouldn't invest too much hope in it no okay um Sharon has made a comment that uh, she has a six-month-old puppy that keeps her on the toes too which is interesting um Sharon's got one more question have you got that one on there have you got that one on there yeah, thank you that's good the eye guide MC. No, what is that? Right, Sharon. Tell us. Let me just find and see if I make a little thought. I'm trying to find it. Gosh, it's not people. Sorry, right down the bottom. Sharon, you can talk now if you unmute. I'm going to look up the eye guide MC. Sharon, if you can unmute, you can speak and explain to Laura. There you are. Hello. Hello, Hi, Sharon. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's something I came across in an exercise class with Reach Your Peak. Um, and it's a device that it was, it was sort of, it looked like a microphone, basically. Um, I'm, I'm actually in a webinar this week that's going to give more information about it. Um, but it, it was obviously to help with some sort of coordination. I wonder whether you'd come across it. I'm just finding it now. Tech. Beautifully simple, non-invasive, not a cure, but an aid. Not guaranteed to work for all yes. people, but we're seeing outstanding results stack up. No yeah. surgery. The device is wireless and discreet. I find it difficult to see what the result, what the device is, actually. Um like I say, the woman looked like Madonna with the with the microphone. Oh, it's a Madonna microphone. Face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't I'm quite sure what it does. Um, uh, right. Okay. Um, I mean, again, what we need to know is whether they've been through any clinical trials. Um, uh, oh, University of Lincoln. He's got some connection with that. Okay, I will again bookmark that. Another one. <laughs> yeah. I think we, at the end, Rory, we ought to say something about your news let, newsletter so that people know it exists. That uh, because it's obviously quite, it's interesting to find out about these odd things that you pick up and try. And... Yeah, I will. I will. Um... 
I've got a slide that shows it, and it shows you the oh, address. Good. For it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I've heard yeah. that one. So uh, a comment from J another Jane um, about they've lost their dog recently, and they're deciding to get another one. And by the way, Rory, you and I have managed to strengthen her resolve to get another one, so that's nice to hear. Um, and there's another question. Could, is that one on the slide already, Martha, or not? About recommending a watch? Or should no, I read it out? pop it up on a slide now. No, don't worry, I can read it out. Can you recommend a watch like the one you're wearing, Rory, since you will have researched it before buying? I hope. <laughs> it's the Apple Watch. It's, the, it's not um, anything special. I mean, I would, I would say that they're quite expensive. Um, uh, but it... Uh, and at the... At the moment, I've not found any particular Parkinson's apps on it, but I think they will be coming. What I, I find it useful for is motivation in terms of exercise, which to me, uh, I'm, I'm not one of these people who does what's it called, PD Warrior or whatever, but I I do just try and hit certain targets each day. And uh, it, it's quite motivating that way. Uh, so it's indirectly useful if one believes, as, as I think most people do, that exercise is is really positive for one's Parkinson's. And by exercise, my regime is not at all organised. It's it's going for a walk first thing and uh, later on, and that used to be motivated by the dog, so I have to motivate myself now. Um, and I do, I do Pilates on a Saturday, I see a personal trainer who's a sort of old friend who walks me up and down the canal and does a bit of boxing with me. And I do some Apple fitness, jumping up and down in front of the television, high intensity training. So a bit of this and a bit Sounds of that. All right. Sounds all right. It doesn't really matter what you do with exercise as long no. as you do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most important thing is to do lots of it, which I think with a lot of us know. Um, now, are there any other questions for Rory before we let him get his dinner? Because I want to show the slide of your news sheet, but that's fine, the newsletter. But because uh, I think the Apple Watch is one of the things I, I we got ours because I, I, I was falling over a lot at one point and right. I, was, I, I was really worried about being caught left on the floor with a broken knee or something, you know. And yeah. uh, it's quite handy to have that no, no, knowledge that you're okay. Yeah. Um, but as you say, there aren't many specific apps, but there are a lot of very clever other apps, of course. Yeah. Awful. Right. Okay. Now, um, somebody who's not named, so I'm going to allow you to talk. I don't know who you are. It says Zoom user. Have you got a question? <laughs> yes. It's Enid. 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 Uh, oh, hello. Hi. Hi, Hi, Jane. We, our son brought us um, a laser and metronome called Nextride from the States when right. he visited us. And that fits on Chris's cane. Mm -hmm. And you've got um it shines a laser on the floor to help with your walking as well as a metronome i don't know if you can see it i don't i've, I've no. not Hang on. Um, it's I'm called gonna... it's called next stride i think there are laser canes over here right, not as good um, as this one but this is quite a this is an american I'm gonna, your, I'm gonna put your camera on now so you should be able to put your camera on the show us ah uh, where is it um That's the mute button. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. Unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Excellent. Still, your mute energy is still muted at the moment. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a bold new step. Right. <laughs> so actually, the, the, the sort of metronome thing, I think that is, in a way, the same kind of theory as, as this, the, the queuing theory, yeah. that having that rhythm is, is helpful. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. Again, um, uh, can I send you my email address? Uh -huh. um, I'm very happy for anyone to have my email address, um, uh, which is Rory Kellen, R O R Y C E W -L, L A N at gmail.com. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Right, if you, can, if you mute yourself again now, if that's all right, and, and turn your video off, then you won't be visible to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Martha, can you put up the slide of Rory's newsletter, please? Uh, there's, there's the address. It is, um, it's called a sub, it's a thing called Substack, which allows you to write a newsletter. Uh, it's free or paid, 
don't bother paying for it because you don't get anything more than if you if you get it for free that's my little tip um uh but i i i post not just about parkinson's but about other things i come across so i've written today uh, i've written two things today actually one about this wonderful man called colonel guy deacon who's been driving across africa uh, he's been diagnosed with Parkinson's for about a decade and he's driving across Africa to um, raise awareness of Parkinson's um, locally and uh, everywhere he goes he gets in touch with me and wants to deliver an update and he's nearly got to Cape Town so that's one thing I've done today and the other thing is about this thing that was on the radio this morning this new research program called Our Future Health recruiting five million people to be monitored and uh, give them early warning, really, of of their uh, uh, whether they they are they're at risk from certain conditions. Right, Rory, I think it's the witching hour. Your dinner will be ready. My dinner's ready. Yeah, <laughs> I'll better let you go. Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for giving up this evening to speak to us. It's been really great listening, listening to what you've got to say, and thank you for your information. And the newsletter is really good to read, so I should keep looking at it. Um, and let's hope we find something really good to help us all soon. Well, thank you, thank you, and thank you for the various tips, the various stories that um, you've all come up with. So it's been really useful. Okay, right. I'm just going to... And just as a final reminder, here's the address for Rory's newsletter. I hope you enjoyed the session tonight. Thank you for listening.